Hello, everybody. This is Jeremy Johnson in southwestern Michigan, and this is episode 40 of Brew You. With me, as always, is my lovely co-host, Justin Levesque. Nope, psych. He's actually not here today. So this will be a solo broadcast, and we'll get on with it. So today I'm going to be reviewing, oddly enough, Stone's Collaboration Unapologetic IPA. Uh, this is a collaboration with uh, other California brewers, uh, namely, um, this is Beachwood Barbecue, and I think they're out of Long Beach. Uh, they have another uh, location as well. Um, and um, Heretic, which is, um, I think they're up towards Napa, really. Um, but again, it's a Dippa, uh, runs about 8.8%. And it's a gorgeous bottle. I really like the design on this. Most of their collaborations have a really good uh, piece of artwork on here. Um, and essentially, there's a, a story on the back. You can see there, a small type, and on their website as well. And it's um, basically the story of three hop heads who wanted to create uh, yet another Dippa. And most people said, why? And they said, why not? So they went ahead and did it. So. That's what I'm going to be drinking today. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Ordinarily, um, if you've never seen the show before, uh, myself and Justin um, and occasionally some other guests um, will drink a couple of new beers and give those a review, scale them on 1 to 10. And uh, then we want to talk about other geek stuff. Uh, since I'm flying solo tonight, um, this will be a, a pretty quick broadcast. So here we go. Let's crack this puppy open. Do, do, do. A little bit of smoke on the uh, opening there. Not a whole lot. You can see it's very clear. See right through it. See me right through it. I'll go ahead and pour this into my Baladin glass. Pours a nice golden pale color, what you might expect from a Dippa. Beautiful. Put the rest of that aside. You can see we've got quite a lot of effervescence going on there. Bottle uh, Bubbles are traveling up pretty quick. Nice foamy head. Uh, it's just about a one and a half finger head maybe. Uh, the ballad in glass kind of changes that slightly. Um, but it's beautiful. It's kind of what you'd expect. Maybe a little more honey and straw than uh, some of the deeper, darker ones that you might find here in Michigan, for instance. Uh, I'm going to give this a whiff. Well, it smells like a traditional uh, stone IPA. Very citrusy, floral, a little bit of yeast, bready qualities. Kind of a sweet maltness there in the background. Um, but, you know, mostly citrus. Just a little bit of soapy quality, just that sudsy kind of I sometimes when I brew beer I get that from uh, the sanitizer when I do that, shake all that up um, it has that just sort of frothy uh, scent to it just kind of clean I guess, crisp and clean which I know some people hate to use that terminology okay, it smells delicious um, maybe a little bit of Pilsner quality too um, just again, that sort of crisp malt, um, very clean. So we're gonna get, dive right into this. Cheers! Mm. Okay. So um, very nice mouthfeel, uh, a little tart towards the back end. Uh, sort of sticking in the roof of the mouth a bit. Um, a little bit of alcohol um, esters. Um, you get just a little bit of heat. Um, it's pretty darn good. It, it reminds me quite a lot of the uh, uh, Enjoy By series. It's got a lot of those similar characteristics. I mean, a Dippa, you know, give or take, is going to taste relatively the same. Now they. They've uh, gone ahead and used some experimental hops in this, um, some that I've never even seen 
in the light of day. Well, that's not true, but uh, have not even been named yet. So they've done a just a bunch of different hops. Um, it says here they did Azica, which I guess is one variety um, that I've never heard of. Belma, never heard of that either. And it says um, and some yet to be named varieties from Washington's Yakima area. So a lot of experimentation going on here. Uh, the end result is. You know, it's not as citrusy as the Enjoy By series. It's not as um, sort of uh, bitey or edgy that a lot of other uh, stone beers. Now, since this is a collaboration, they've got, you know, a little bit of uh, input from the other guys, or a lot of bit of input, maybe. Um, so it's a little more complex. You do get the yeast in there. Um, it sort of has a bread, like a sort of a fresh sourdough bread quality. Some nice lacing, nice sweetness up front, and then it kind of goes and the hops kind of leave a rough uh, quality on your tongue, as you might expect. You get that pinch right here on the sides. Um... And as it's starting to warm up here a little bit, I'm getting much more of the sweetness on the tongue. It's sort of sticking around a lot longer than you know you would uh, imagine a lighter beer would. I mean, at 8.8 percent, it's going to be you know with you for a bit. Um, that soapy quality is there. I mean, that that must be an aspect of the hops. Um, it's just sort of imparting that sort of almost a soapy, oily characteristic, you know, sort of a soapy, oily characteristic. Um, when, when you smell Dawn dish liquid, uh, the unscented variety, you can kind of get that that sensation of, uh, you know, almost like laundry detergent too, the kind that has no additives or, or odors uh, in it. There's pineapple, there's so a little bit of peach, some melon. Um, it's just, it's a really delicious beer. Um, I, I don't, it's not as addictive, I guess, um, as the Enjoy By series, which I find to be very, you kind of want to keep drinking more and more of it. Um, this is just, you know, a, a nice dipper, very well balanced. Uh, there's not not a whole lot surprising going on here. It's it's quite good. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, um, but there's nothing sort of out of the box uh, for a dipper that I can taste, even with the experimental hops. Um, I'm not I'm not getting anything that's that I haven't had before. Let's put it that way. Um, I I kind of crave that when we're looking at these collaboration beers that you know you want something to be born of all those ideas. You want something new to be born, and I'm not sure. And they kind of I think they kind of realize that when they when they pose that question. Um, does the world need another IPA, or so what if there's another dip on the market? Um, so I think they realize that they've crafted a really solid, delicious dip, uh, but at the end of the day, it's not going to change the world. It's not going to, uh, you know, be something that you, you have to have, like a Pliny or, or even the Enjoy By, which I, I seek out with passion. Um, but it's, it's quite good. I like it a lot. So on the grand scale of things, um, again, an apologic IPA, uh, Beachwood, which I guess is a barbecue place, and I would love to try that. I looked at their websites, and they, uh, they brew quite a lot of interesting beers beyond this. Beechwood seems to be less about this type of style. Heretic seems to be more in line with Stone. There, you can see that there's a, uh, a definite uh, synchronicity there. 
um, a, a synergy between their styles. So I think uh, I think Heretic and Stone are probably a good match, and um, Beechwood is kind of the the unknown quotient or the unknown additive here. Um, so who knows how much they added? But the, the Beachwood barbecue sounds like a lot of fun too, and and uh, I'm not sure. I don't think we're getting to California anytime soon, but that would be some place I'd, I'd definitely want to seek out and see if their food is as good as uh, as their beers. Um, but having said that, uh, it's a really enjoyable. Um, I'm gonna give this an eight out of ten, um, edging towards a nine, but I think it's gonna be an eight. Um, only because it's not, it's it's good, and, and maybe even great, but it's not. There's nothing new there, um, and I kind of wanted that, but that's okay. I'll wait till the uh, 18th anniversary uh, IPA and see if that has anything different for me. So. That's it. Um, we can talk a little bit more about beer uh, right now. Um, I did get to try the Founders Dissenter IPL uh, Indian Pale Lager a couple days ago. Uh, I picked up a bottle at a uh, uh, place up the road here, a uh, liquor cabinet. Um, I think it was right in the neighborhood of nine nine bucks for the tall boy, uh, which is about right in line. And it's Founders. I was really curious, and it's their backstage series. Um, so the Mango Magnifico uh, was one of those. Um, there were a couple others, but the Mango was the one that sort of stuck out for me. Um, and this was quite good. I mean, if you're t looking for something that's, if not different, different for founders. Um, it, you know, it's cold lagered, um, very hoppy. Uh, it reminds me quite a lot of this. Um, I can't remember what the uh, ABV on that was. I'm, I got it pulled up here. Uh, blah, 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 8.7. So actually, pretty dang similar to this. I mean, this is 8.8, .8 and I, I liked it a lot. Um, it was uh, the founders' uh, dissenter was quite um, juicy. Uh, it was the first one of the first beers from them that I thought really represented a true Californian style. Um, an, an IPA, and maybe the IPL is um, sort of something they did to sort of differentiate themselves, because if you poured that into a glass next to something like this, I have a really rough time uh, figuring it out. Um, and they don't really specify which hops they used in the, uh, in the dissenter. So I'm thinking that they've probably used um, I know they're pretty hep on the centennial, but it tasted to me as if they they had incorporated some falconer. Uh, oh, what's the other one? There's a, there's a couple really citrusy Californian type hops um, that it just tasted like something that you would get from a California brewery. So uh, having said that, I, I would really recommend you check it out if you can. Um, go go seek it out. You, right now on the shelves, there's quite a lot of it. Um, it says suggested retail price is 11.99 per bottle, but I kind of think I paid less than that. It, it's worth seeking out. Um, it's it's pretty dang good. So um, that was that. Um, also, uh, I I've been doing a little brewing. You see, I've updated my board back there. Um, I right now I've got the uh, Maltese. No, that's that. The Dortmunder uh, is. A sort of a nice traditional German brew, um, and it's uh, it just went into bottles last week, so it's been uh, room conditioning uh, for about a week now. It'll go another week and then pop into the into the uh, fridge. But my taste test of that was quite nice, um, very very smooth, very just really well balanced, um, and just tasted like a traditional German beer. Um, Hofbrau, that that type of thing. It was just very good. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And then I also brewed up the uh, San, uh, Santa Catalina Pale Ale, which um, is a mix of mostly American ale uh, malts and with some Cascade uh, pellet hops added to it. 
Um, so I'm, and that's in the keg right now. It's been at room temp for a week, and uh, it'll go into bottles next week. And I'm real curious about that because I've always wanted to sort of do a, a nice hopped regular sort of ale, American ale, um, but but hop it up a bit. So it's going to be a pale ale. It's going to be right around 7% ABV. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how that turns out. So, plus last Friday, or was it last Friday? No, two weeks ago, Friday. Um, I got to uh, help my brother uh, Brian brew his first batch. Um, that was a lot of fun. He did. Um, I'm trying to remember what he did, but we we added some additional hops. We went out and got some Falconer uh, hops and added that to the mix. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. He bottled that last night. He uh, texted me and said that he uh, he bottled 11 bottles. So um, he's off to a good start. That's his first batch, and and we'll see we'll see how it goes. So so that's pretty much it for beer. Um, I want to talk a little bit about music. Um, I picked up the uh, latest Judas Priest album, Redeemer of Souls, which is uh, pretty good. I, it took took a little while for me to sort of um, get used to it because. I really liked uh, Nostradamus, um, their sort of grand, epic, operatic rock um, piece of work, um, a double album, I think. And uh, I, I thought that was brilliant in sort of a unique and interesting way for the uh, band to grow. But they, uh, they, it was not well received, which I thought was, you know, quite a shame. And um, I really, it's really sort of grown on me. I, I sort of, I liked it right out of the gate. Like some tracks, it sort of made sense. But I can see that with some fans, they might, you know, crave the old Judas Priest or classic Judas Priest. Um, and, and that's what they get with Redeemer of Souls is sort of a return to that uh, classic uh, heavy metal sound. Um, maybe a little too classic um, in some instances. I uh, it, it took me at least two complete listenings to sort of even start to consider to like it, and now that I've I've listened to it a few times, it, it's good. I mean, it's I can see that the creativity is still there, and of course Rob Halford has has a phenomenal voice still, and um, so if you, if you're craving some classic heavy metal. Uh, but new songs, then this is probably the the album for you. Um, so Redeemer of Souls, I think it's it's pretty good. Um, it's definitely not as good as some of their you know really classic albums, but they're trying, and it's a good mix too. Like I I loved Angel of Retribution. Um, I thought that was a, a you know a way to create new heavy metal without having to sort of harken back to your old stuff. And Redeemer of Souls does that. It, it does borrow phrases from earlier songs and sort of, you know, you can point to a song and say, that sounds just like Defender, Defenders of the Faith. You know, that, that's, that's something, that's a track that could have been peeled straight off there. Um, and, of course, they, they've lost their, one of their guitarists, uh, K.K. Tipping, I think. Um, he retired back in uh, I think 2010 or 2011, so he's no longer with them. They picked up a new guitarist who can thrash a bit uh, quicker, so they get into some speed metal type uh, tracks, which is nice. So, um, want to talk a little bit about movies? Um, we, I just saw uh, and had been wanting to see a movie called Blue Ruin. Um, and if you're fans of uh, Draft House Films, who uh, is the sort of production arm, I believe, of uh, Alamo Draft House Theaters, uh, they've they've uh, they picked up distribution of that movie, and it's it's quite good. If you like um, if you like the Kill List, um, then you'll like this movie as well. It's it's uh, you know I don't want to give too much away because there, there's some revealing stuff there, but it's a, a typical, I don't want to say typical, uh, it's a revenge flick. And uh, the things that happen are so heartbreaking and violent that it's um, it, it's just it's just really good. I mean, it's, it's one of those sort of 
low key. Um, you know, it takes a little while to develop, but when it does, it's like just a punch to the solar plexus. Um, so Blue Ruin is the name of the flick. Uh, it's very quick. I think it's an hour and a half. Um, it, but it's if you like movies like Drive um, or any of the other uh, Nicholas Winding Riffin, whatever his name is, uh, that director's stuff, then I think you will really like this. Um, so Blue Ruin, it's quite good. It's on DVD right now, so it's not on Netflix just yet, but might be depending because I, you know, I think this is one of those films that flew under the radar for a lot of folks, and um, for those who have seen it, it's it's uh, they tout it, but I don't think it'll ever get. And, and I don't recommend it for um, sort of mass viewing. Like you're not going to see a family go see this rated R movie, and and if you're you know at all squeamish. Um, it's not going to be your cup of tea either. But it it, it also reminded me a lot of uh, Winner's Bone, if you saw that movie with Jennifer Lawrence. Um, it's got that same sort of sensibility, that sort of creeping rural dread um, that plays so well. So check that out, Blue Ruin. That's quite, quite good. Um, this morning I also watched a uh, documentary called uh, Jodorowsky's Jodorowsky's Dune. Um, Alejandro Jodorowsky is a director, Spanish director, um, who who does surrealist movies. Um, I saw Sante, uh, Santa Sangre uh, quite a few years back after reading about it in uh, a movie magazine, and you know, I hear I was thinking it was going to be a more or less uh, standard sort of horror pick. Uh, and, and what I got instead was sort of a Dali-esque, uh, surreal, um, Grand Guignol, uh, really, really sort of out there, but gory and funny and mi sort of mind-blowing in a lot of ways. So that that was my introduction to Jodorowsky. And uh, I, I've sort of, you know, been on the fence about seeing his, some of his other stuff, his earlier things like El Topo and uh, I forget what the mountain one is, Top of the Mountain or At the Mountain. Um, and he's got quite a few other ones that I have not yet seen, but uh, this is about his 1974 attempt to make uh, Frank Herbert's Dune and, and how they essentially, he assembled this awesome team of really famous folks and they were had produced it and were to the point of actually starting to build sets for it and then the funding got yanked and it's about that sort of um, fight if you will that battle that he fought at for over almost three years and how it came to nothing if you ever saw um, the uh, Terry Gilliam film a documentary uh, I think it was called Who Killed Don Quixote is that it? Or the man? No, the man from La Mancha. I think that was called something along those lines. But it's a documentary about how uh, Terry Gilliam tried to make uh, the Don Quixote film year like over and over again, and for whatever reason, floods, mudslides, all sorts of disasters happened, and he was never able to actually make it make the film. So that, that's a really interesting documentary too and I, I, I should Google that real quick for you but if you look up the Terry Gilliam uh, Don Quixote uh, film uh, you'll, you'll figure that out. And I think it was Johnny Depp who was going to star in it and that fell through. But uh, I just read this morning actually that uh, Terry Gilliam uh, wrote that he has secured financing for the film in a, in a modified state uh, that's going to start in Christmas. They're going to start filming that Christmas. So I'm excited to see that. Um, now that he's done with Zero Theorem, um, I'm real curious to see what uh, what he might do with that. So I hear he's changed it quite a bit. So it's not you know, just about that sort of that narrative of Don Quixote. It's about uh, a director who makes the film and then everybody is cursed after that. So it sounds kind of an interesting take on that. So but Jodorowsky's Dune, you've got to check that out. And if you haven't seen any of his films, um, you know, go in prepared for a surreal experience, a Dali-esque experience. Um, but I think you'll like it if you like that sort of thing. And it's it 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 pushes the boundaries um, of 
you know, it makes you think about your ethics and uh, and your taste. So check that out. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is um, books, and I'm actually um, after a hiatus of reading books. Um, I've been doing you know uh, magazines and and a couple other sort of you know, short form stuff, but um, I picked up the latest issue, Volume Six of the Best Horror of the Year, and that's off to a good start. Ellen Datlow is the uh, editor. I've been following her and all of her anthologies for years now, and if you like um, short stories and even novellas, there are some longer form uh, stories in there. Um, this is definitely a way to, you know, sort of catch up on what's going on in the world of horror. It is interesting to note that you know back when I started reading her stuff, um, when it you know there used to be like the year's best fantasy and horror and you know all those sorts of things. Um, the definition of horror has sort of gone through a transition over the course of years, and and what actually appears in the best horror of the year is really subjective. It can it's not necessarily what you might classify as traditional horror or or you know, styles that you would expect or narratives that you would expect. Um, some could even be, you know, labeled as melodrama. Or, you know, it's it, it's a very fine line as to what is horror these days, I think. Um, and I believe that stems from the sort of, you know, backlash of uh, early 80s uh, crap dime store novels where, you know, places like Walden Books and B. Dalton um, eliminated their horror section, which I still find mind-boggling, but there was a, uh, uh, a sensibility at the time that there was such a black mark on the term horror that it... Uh, it was not marketable anymore, so they had to wrap that up in fiction. So you might still see a science fiction section, you might see a mystery or thriller section, but you won't see a horror section, at least not in mass-produced, mass-run uh, bookstores. It just doesn't occur anymore, which is really sad in my opinion, because there's nothing I hate worse than having to dig through the massive general fiction um, section at a bookstore uh, to find, or even on your Kindler, you know, it's like there there are no no horror categories um, to find that you know a, a new piece of art to read. Um, it's very disappointing to me, but there you have it. Uh, which is why I kind of like these um, anthologies because they collect them all in one you know compilation and. And they, they call it what it is. It's the best horror of the year, even if that definition is sort of, you know, softened or changed over the years. So, Okay, well, that's all I've got for you today. Um, appreciate you sticking around. Uh, like I said, uh, if you want to keep up with us, please uh, subscribe to our channel or join us here on Google+, Plus. add us to your circles. Um, as Felicia and Ryan Day say, uh, shall I subscribe? So click the button, wherever that might be. And uh, we, we try to do a broadcast about once every week. Depends uh, sometimes when that might be. But we'll, we'll always notify you um, through these channels. And if you're subscribed, you'll get the notification. So, um, Otherwise, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and I hope you're drinking some good beer as well. All right, until next time, brew you.